need some volunteers. At least one, maybe four. You can do it from there if you want to volunteer. Let's go, friend. All right, come on up. Second volunteer? Your parts are very easy in this story. None! Okay, fine. Be that way. I'm sorry, no, 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 too late now. Too late now. <laughs> you can all be volunteers two, three, and four. Now you'll know your parts when I point to you, and I have such confidence in you that I'm not even going to tell you what your line is. <laughs> You're going to know already. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Our text for this morning is from the book of John, chapter 10, <laughs> verse 11. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Our story begins with a mother pig who has sent her three little children out into the world to build their lives. The first pig was not very industrious, and he built a home for himself out of straw. It was quick, it was easy, and it left him enough piggy cash left over to go out and go bowling at the local bowling alley. The second pig was not much more adventurous. He built a house out of sticks and used the money he had left over to go to Denny's where he avoided the pigs in a blanket on the menu <laughs> or the bacon and eggs. <laughs> the third pig, however, was a very serious and industrious young pig. He spent the money he'd been given to build a house full of bricks. And as they were sitting in their house watching daytime dramas, the big bad wolf came along. <laughs> and he went up to the home of the first pig and he knocked on the door. And he said, A huff and puff and blow your house down. Didn't he ask to get into the house first? He didn't start huffing right away, did he? <laughs> Whatever happened to little pig, little pig, let me come in. Let's try, come here. Come here. Let's try. <laughs> and with that bold request, the pigs all replied, Well, you're about as industrious as the pig. Okay. <laughs> all right, so the pig wouldn't let the wolf in, and then the wolf threatened him and said, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. <laughs> it's not very wolfy. <laughs> I would have figured, I'll huff. And I'll puff, and I'll blow your house down. <laughs> Sorry, we still got two more pigs to go. <laughs> and so he blew the house down. And he would have eaten that little pig, except the pig ran to the home of his brother in the house made of sticks. But the wolf followed and knocked on the door. And he asked if he could come in. Little pig. Little pig, little pig, let me in. And the pigs all said, Not my hair, my chin, chin, chin. Do you guys know this story? And what did the wolf do next? He huffed and puffed and blew their house down. He did indeed. 
And so the two little pigs ran to the home of the third brother and were safe inside that house until the wolf appeared. And he asked those pigs, Little pigs, little pigs, let me in. And the pigs all said, Not like the hair of my chin, chin, chin. And the pig said, or wolf said, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. And he did. He huffed and he puffed and he puffed and he huffed and he blew with all his might. But the house did not come down. So being a very clever wolf, he climbed up onto the roof and was going to slide down the chimney like Santa Claus. But the pigs were ready for him. Do you remember what they did? What did they do? They put a, 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 a pot of water that was boiling in the pig. I mean, the wolf fell in. They put a pot of water to boil in the fireplace. And when the wolf slid down the chimney, the pigs had wolf stew for supper. <laughs> Thank you very much. You may go sit down. I was almost tempted to have you sing with me, you know, who's afraid of the big fat wolf? You, you probably worn yourself out with all your chinny chin chinning. <laughs> what is it about the wolf? that nobody likes. We have the story of the three little pigs who wind up eating the wolf. In fact, one time I read this story from the wolf's point of view. This poor homeless veteran who was simply trying to find a place to live because he had no place to lay his head. But these three slumlord pigs would not let him in. It was a clear case of wolf discrimination. But he's not the only one. You've got Little Red Riding Hood, where the wolf doesn't get a good story. There's Peter and the wolf. There's the boy who cried, wolf. In fact, it seems that almost every culture has its wolf story, including the Bible. For Jesus talks about his flock of sheep and how the wolf tries to attack, but the sheep are protected through the diligent and dedicated work of the one who cares for the sheep, the shepherd. And Jesus even points out that the difference between someone who is taking care of his own sheep or someone who is taking care of the sheep of someone else is that in time of danger, if they're not your sheep, the temptation to cut and run can be irresistible. But Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and I lay my life down for my sheep. Now, I've got a question for you. This is going to be an interactive sermon, so I hope you came prepared to participate. Your first question if you could be any animal, what would it be? So no, if you could be any animal, what would you be? I know there are so many choices. <laughs> yes, glory. You would be what? A shark. A shark. Okay. Who else has an answer? You would be a pit bull. Okay. Fierce animal. That only gets a bad rap in history. Okay? Who else? Who would want to be something? Horse. Sheila? A horse. A horse. Okay. Manwood. An eagle. An eagle. How come nobody wants to be a sheep? And actually, when you think about it, lion is another possibility. Lions, sharks, 
Colts, Eagles. Those are all mascots for professional sports teams. Now there's the St. Louis Rams. But how come we don't have a professional sports team who has a sheep as their mascot? No one's going to be afraid of a sheep. Exactly. No one's afraid of a sheep because sheep are harmless and helpless. In fact, I read in my research that if a sheep falls over on its back, it can't get back up again. Its belly is exposed to any predator that might come along, such as the wolf or the eagle. Nobody ever wants to be a sheep. Sheep are also kind of dumb. Okay? Show you what I mean. A typical blonde female, well, I'm in trouble now, had gotten sick of all the dumb blonde jokes. So she decided to get a makeover, cutting and dyeing her hair. And after buying a new convertible, she set out for a drive in the country where she came across a herd of sheep grazing in the field. Thinking to herself, Ew, they look so cute! She stopped got out of her car and engaged the shepherd in conversation. She told him that she thought these sheep were just so adorable, like, you know, like I'd like to have like one. And the shepherd said, tell you what, if you can guess the exact number of sheep I have here in the field, I'll let you have your pick of whatever sheep you want. And without a moment's hesitation, the girl said, 383. <laughs> uh, that's exactly correct. You may pick whatever sheep you want, said the stunned shepherd. So she made her choice. And as she was loading her sheep into the car, the shepherd said, tell you what, double or nothing, if I can guess the original color of your hair. Would you give me my dog back, please? <laughs> <laughs> In the Bible, God calls us sheep because we too are dirty and defenseless and dependent and, yes, sometimes dumb. We do foolish things without thinking. We make poor choices without stopping to consider the consequences. And we make decisions about our relationship with God that have eternal consequences and have no problem making those decisions if it is in our own limited best interest. Jesus talks to us about being a good shepherd. To illustrate what I mean by that, I'll tell you another story. Once upon a time, there was a butcher. And a woman came into the store and wanted to purchase a whole chicken. Now, the butcher only had one left. So he reached down into his bin, he brought up that one chicken and put it on the scale and said, this chicken will cost you $4.85. And the woman said, gee, I don't know, seems kind of small. Do you have anything larger? Yes, I do, said the dishonest butcher. And he took that same chicken, put it back into the vat that had ice in it, and he stuffed ice inside the chicken. <laughs> put it back up on the scale and said, see, this one weighs a whole pound more. This one will be $7.95. And the woman said, that's great. Tell you what, I'll take them both. <laughs> oops. Have you ever had an oops moment? Have you ever done something or gotten involved with something 
and then realized, oops, I've been caught, or this wasn't a very good decision, or this isn't turning out so well. I submit to you that there are really only three points in our life history, past, present, and future. And each one of us, in looking back on our past, can identify occasions or events where we've made poor choices. I would go so far as to say we can identify times where we made wrong choices. I would go even further to say these are times when we have disobeyed God's will and made choices that were based on what we want and what pleases us and not what God wants or what would please God. And there are some people whose life from that point forward is scarred and marred because they drag the consequences of that past and their guilt for their actions forward with them. And there are those people who feel that God is an angry judge who's going to squash them like a bug for the poor decisions they've made. But Jesus calls himself the Good Shepherd. Now in my research I discovered that there are two words in the Greek New Testament which we translate in English as the word good. The first is agathose. It's a word that refers to a person of quality and high moral character. A person is good if they perform their assigned task well. Jeremiah, I like to use agathose to describe you and say you did a good job up here a few minutes ago. You were a good wolf. Our pigs were a little wimpy, but you were a good wolf. Okay? The other Greek word is kalos. And it includes all of the same attributes that I just mentioned, but it adds another quality that of loveliness and attractiveness. It's the kind of goodness that Jesus has because it's the kind of goodness that cares for us and helps us to feel loved, wanted, and secure. Jesus has the strength to be a good shepherd. He has the mind of God to make the right choices for us, and he has the heart of God to continue loving us even when we're kind of sheepish. A couple of points to make on that. First, Jesus as the good shepherd lays down his life for a sheep. When I lived in Minnesota and visited one of my congregation members, I saw a very strange lamb. It appeared to have two heads and eight legs. And I asked Sigurd, the man of the, of the farm, what's with this strange looking sheep? And so he took me out there where I discovered it was not a strange looking sheep at all, but rather a sheep wearing a sheep coat. Turns out this sheep's mother had died. And so he placed this lamb with another sheep that had just given birth in the hopes that she would take this sheep as her own and feed it. But for all their weaknesses, sheep do have a very good sense of smell. 
And this you could tell that this lamb was not one of hers. And so she rejected it. As it turns out, one of her own lambs had died. And so Sigurd skinned the animal and took the pelt from the second lamb and draped it over the first. So that now it had a scent that Mama could recognize. And so Mama accepted this child, this baby lamb, as her own. Notice that Jesus says he willingly lays down his life for us. No one forced Jesus to the cross. He chose to do that. Now, secondly, Jesus tells us that the good shepherd knows the sheep by name. Another story. A woman came into her pastor's office, troubled about this state that Jesus knows us by name. And she asked, how is it possible that God knows me personally? Now, perhaps there have been times when you have felt alone, or afraid, or abandoned, or have felt that God does not care about you or for you. Anybody ever had that experience? Hold your hand up. Okay, good. Now while your hands are in the air, would you turn around so it's facing yourself? See your fingerprints? Every single one of us has a unique set of prints. No two people have the same fingerprints. If God saw fit to give you fingerprints that were uniquely yours, there's your assurance that God knows you well enough to call you by name. It's an assurance that you are special in God's eyes. Which brings me to the third point. It relates to our baptism this morning. Because God cared enough for us to offer his life, and because he knows each of us by name, he didn't have to ask uh, which one is Vincent and which one is Harlot. I mean, the fact that Vincent was wearing pants and Harlot was in a dress, I wasn't going to take any chances. I wanted to be sure that I had the right child and was baptizing with the right name. Sometimes I get a little confused. God never gets confused. God knows who we are, and God brings us into this intimate relationship with us. Well, you can disagree if you want, Vincent. <laughs> but the thing is, God loves you and adopts you this morning into his family so that you can be a part of of his heavenly kingdom. And Arlen, you're sleeping through the whole thing. Obviously, you're not very impressed with the fact that God has adopted you into his kingdom. That's okay. Some of us aren't very impressed with it either at times. But to know that God cares about you individually and loves you individually and considered you special enough to offer himself for you is a truly remarkable thing. It's why we baptize. So that for the rest of their lives, if ever any circumstances should occur for either Arlen or Vincent, where they are tempted to feel alone or afraid or abandoned or guilty or regretful for a decision made, they will know that there is a God who loved them enough to offer himself for them and who will never, ever abandon them or give them up. And that is the same assurance God provides for each and every one of us. We who have been baptized can know that no matter how badly we screw up, God forgives. 
No matter how frightened or troubled we are by circumstances in our life, we know that God cares. When it seems like everything is going wrong, and we figure the only thing that's going to happen next is something else going badly, God is there by our side. No, it's no magic formula. God is not going to abracadabra our circumstances and make them wonderful. But God will be there with us in our troubled times. Jesus is our good shepherd who loves us now and each day from here forward. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. We worship God with our offerings.